I spent so much time organizing my like layout to this, so hopefully, hopefully it looks good. Um, I wanted to just have a genuine conversation about dressage and some of the like struggles and pieces that I've struggled with and parts that I've watched other amateurs specifically struggle, struggle with and just kind of talk through that part, talk through some of the like difficult parts of the sport, the struggling parts of the sport. Um, and part of why I, I want to talk about that is <clears throat> if, if you've done dressage for very long, you come to realize that it is wonderful and amazing and the horses are awesome, but it's not for the faint of heart. Like there's a, a part in dressage that's challenging or there are many parts in dressage that are super tough and super challenging and I wanted to jump on here and talk with you guys because a I think it's it's nice to know just that like some of the things that you guys maybe are experiencing right now like I've experienced a lot of those things too you know I'm a professional and I have a different perspective on this sport but I do find that a lot, there are a lot of similarities in the things that I struggle with to the things that other uh, adult amateurs are out there struggling with or also other professionals. Um, so A, it's nice to know that. Um, if you're new here, my name is Joseph Newcomb. I'm a trainer, I've been a dressage trainer for a long time now, but I came from kind of a unique background from the natural horsemanship uh, Western background, uh, where I found a ton of value learning a different style, different ways of riding. Um, from there in the like natural horsemanship, ranch, cowboy, uh, however you want to categorize it, some wonderful horsemen in that background of mine. Um, I went and spent, uh, I think it was six or seven years at Stefan Peters. Um, there I didn't train directly with Stefan. I was just uh, boarding at the, the barn and running my training business out of there. And I learned a, a ton there um, and being around some other, other trainers there as well. Um, but so let's, let's talk about some of the natural struggles in this sport. Um, I was thinking about it the other day that there are like kind of three main categories that I think of in the sport. Um, one is our ability to work on ourselves. And that's part of what I absolutely love about the sport. I think the art of dressage is training the horse, but the true art of dressage is figuring out how to work on ourselves to be better to it's a self-improvement thing how can we work on ourselves to support our horses better because ultimately if we support our horses they they want to do things the right way so there's that component working on ourselves the next component is uh, master coaching i guess you could call it or drawing on experience one of the one of the first uh, natural horsemanship people that I was with, his name was Larry Fleming, and he would say, there's no substitute for experience. And then he would also say, sometimes the best way to get experience is through bad judgment, or like, how do you get good judgment from bad judgment? That's kind of firsthand. Um, but the other thing is like master coaching. Like if you have somebody who's experienced, who you can learn from, and they can show you things, you can cut off a lot of that uh, trajectory. So there's definitely a huge value in like struggling and learning on your own. But this sport is so complex and so difficult that it's so important to be around someone who's really, really good, really, really talented and can kind of help you generate ideas and learn how to support your horses. Um, so, okay, so there's that. 
your self kind of journey with self-improvement, learning how to ride, working on yourself. Master coaching that's applying some experience to that. Uh, some You're generating some ideas, putting tools in your toolbox, uh, getting eyes on the ground, all of those things. And then over here, which is, you know, maybe we could flip this around and put this at the beginning, but this part over here is horsepower. And one of the hardest things for me in this sport in particular has been the horsepower component. Um, as much as we love this sport and it's pure and it's wonderful and the horsemanship is raw, there's a component in dressage that, is, that can torture you, uh, which is the financial component of, you know, these horses are so expensive and, and so scarce, the high-performing horses. And because of that, it makes it challenging to have access to horses to ride and horses to learn on. Um, so, so what do I mean by this? I mean that if we want to be an artist, we need canvases. We need canvases so that we can paint and paint and paint and learn and paint some more and learn and paint some more and, you know, the 10,000 hour rule. If we're going to put 10,000 hours of work in and figure out how to become a, a master at riding dressage, that means that we need a lot of horsepower. Um, and getting that horsepower can be super, super challenging um, and frustrating sometimes, you know, if you end up uh, with a horse that, you know, has lameness issues or is behavioral and you can't ride it or things like that, that can be really, really frustrating and discouraging. Let's pull back a little bit from that and, and talk a little bit about, I'll tell some of my stories of what I've been frustrated with in the past and then tell you guys how I've come to be at a better place in this journey of learning how to ride, I guess you could say. In the past, it, or like even early on, I'm an extremely competitive person and I came into dressage very oriented at getting to the top of the sport. Uh, so performing at, you know, the big things, the Olympics, the things like that. And I think that as I've come along, I've learned that there's a important distinction of adjusting your mental focus as to what success is um, or what joy is in this sport. That shift is not only important for your joy and your own self, but also the whole hugely important part that, you know, is such a conversation these days, which is the horse welfare, um, you know, being kind and good to our horses. I want to find joy in developing and training and bringing along horses. Seeing incremental improvement in that kind of long grind of a journey, those little building blocks, those little stepping stones that I can take, the more that we can get joy out of those little pieces, I feel like the healthier relationship you have with sport, um, with dressage. If we get too focused on the destination, like this is so cliche, it's the journey, not the destination, but the more focus we get on, we want to show pre-St. George, we want to um, ride a Grand Prix test, we want to get our gold medal, we want to go to the Olympics. Those things are awesome. And that actually provides us direction, you know, like we want to try to teach our horse to do these things. The true joy in dressage should come from building little steps and making in incremental improvement with your horse. 
And, and that shift, then, then it becomes a puzzle, you know? You're, you're approaching dressage on a daily basis as a puzzle of how do I get this better? How do I improve this? Dressage means training. And, and the more we embrace that philosophy, dressage doesn't mean showing. Dressage doesn't mean winning. Dressage doesn't even mean competing. Dressage means developing, training, improving, um, self-reflection, those pieces, problem solving. The more that I can shift my mindset into that, that viewpoint, um, the healthier relationship I've had with the sport. In terms of master coaching, uh, there's a few things. Like, I think if you can find a coach that can help you generate ideas, that's awesome. And this is important because it's, it's important as an amateur that knows that you don't have the information that you go to seek information, right? So you go to your trainer to find the right answers. But I also would challenge that and say that the sooner as an amateur you can understand that the only thing, the only thing that has the true answers is your horse. Your trainer doesn't have the ultimate answers. Your trainer may have tools in their toolbox and your trainer may have ideas or even things that work. But allow yourself the power and independence to be connected rider to horse. If you go rider and there's a trainer in the middle and then horse and you never connect rider to horse directly, um, I feel like that disconnect becomes actually a point of tension in the journey. So it's a weird feeling training horses. Like it's a, a struggle and it's slow. And especially with your own horses, you're like really like working through. Sometimes it doesn't even feel good. You're kind of grinding through or struggling through this slow process of self-improvement. And I think that your trainer should be collaborative in assisting you or generating ideas. But it's very important that you, as an individual connected to your horse, allow that connection to kind of... Uh, provide you with direction. I don't know if I'm being as clear as I could with how I articulate this. And part of that's because I've never really tried to articulate this before. What I'm trying to say is that the relationship between the rider and the horse is the primary, most important relationship. And if the rider detaches their thinking mind their problem-solving mind and just says, I'm going to move and do exactly what my trainer tells me to do, we, we stop riding with feel. And so it's super challenging. And part of the problem with this is if I'm telling you as an amateur, don't listen to your coach, listen to your, yourself and your own body and follow your instinct and, and ride the horse, that's awesome, but if you're limited with your education and you're on the wrong pathway, which I have been on before, and you're saying, my coach is wrong because I have a different way of riding, that can lead you off in the wrong direction. That's actually not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that when your coach provides something, add it to your toolbox even entertain an idea that may feel challenging or difficult or like you disagree with because there may be a part in that trainer that is influencing you 
that has a point and that is actually pushing you to become a better rider. I'll give you a, li a little example of this. Like when I came from natural horsemanship, I wanted to do everything so light and so soft in the hand. And some of the coaches are like, you need more connection, Joseph. You need to connect the horse so that you can get them through the body. And I was always like, push that idea away. I'm going to do it light. I'm a very stubborn person. Hindsight, as you go down the road and you learn from the horses and you try to ride Grand Prix and you do this whole journey, I've realized that like, and look back on it and I'm like, hey, like they were totally right in what they were trying to get me to do. So yeah, I think that piece, uh, adjusting your mental approach to dressage is hugely important and having a healthy relationship with some a trainer somebody who's helping you idea generations clinics things like that with this whole process of like how do i learn how to ride how do i learn to support my horse now let's jump into the the horsepower component of this because i think that's really really important um as a high performance rider all the way down to as an amateur managing your quiver of horses managing your access to sitting on horses is really important and and also how you go about the approach there one of the things that i've you know always loved and why as a business with EDI I've always pursued young horses is because of the joy and the desire to develop a relationship with the horses, develop horses from a young age and train them to, to improve through the years. I actually think that as much as people think if I'm gonna go buy a trained horse, I'm cautious with this. As much as people think buy a trained horse and learn the movements, there is for sure 100% a time and place for that. But there is also, with that comes a whole different struggle um, and a whole feeling that that horse isn't yours. And actually a lot of the joy in this sport is the, the biggest joy that I've had in this sport is seeing improvement over time with the horses. And so it, in the art of training the horses, does this mean that you shouldn't go, you know, buy that pre-St. George schoolmaster, buy that Grand Prix schoolmaster? Not necessarily. I think that those horses hold a super important role in teaching us dressage. And there's a place for sure, 100% for that. But there's also a place for developing the horses. The other thing that I would say that I wish I saw more of is more commitment to time, to giving the horses time to develop. And so I, from what I've seen in my business, the amateurs that are willing to commit to a young horse and commit to developing that young horse over a period of time, um, A, they're happier, they have a better relationship with their horses, but B, that time goes by quickly and those horses grow up and those amateur riders have a trained, nice horse that they've developed a relationship with down the road, even if the amateur isn't riding them. So the, some of the young horses that have sold that are three or four, they go to a program, they're developed with a trainer in conjunction with an amateur as a, as a whole, and those horses develop into that person's next horse. I think there's for sure a mistake in the, the I, I'm hesitant to call it the American mentality, but the the mentality of looking for the horse that you need today. I would encourage people to look for the horse that you need in the future. That means 
invest. Invest in dressage. Invest in the training. Invest in the process. And find joy in that process. So that means go buy that three-year-old, you know, and buy, source it and evaluate it for the talent and look at it and figure it out and then jump in. And you may be like, holy crap, this horse is super green and this is a hard journey. For sure you're going to have those moments. But on that pathway, outside of the safety components, you have to make sure you're safe. You have to make sure the temperament is good. You have to make sure that your trainer is capable. Outside of that, once you jump in and you're on that journey, there's so much joy to be had in developing horses. And that's really so much of what dressage is about. I want to touch on a, f a few more things, and I'm not sure exactly how much time my camera has left, so hopefully it doesn't cut me off and end. There, the sport is challenging, and I've spoken about this before on YouTube, in the jealousy and the resentment and the community that we're around. And I think it's important to touch on this and say that you're not alone. And also to understand a little bit more where that comes from and how to emotionally, mentally deal with it and in some ways insulate yourself that you can't control those people out there with their eyes and their, you know, thoughts on, on how you're riding and things like that. But also understand what causes that dynamic. So dressage is a sport that has a lot of scarcity, meaning um, it's not accessible to everyone. If you think of basketball, anybody can pick up a basketball, anybody can practice for 25 hours, I have the same size basketball hoop as LeBron James, and I have the same basketball that LeBron James has. The only difference is he's put hours and hours and hours of it practice in. He's also an athletic freak. I can access, I can do the same things that he can do in terms of our opportunities. One of the frustrating things in dressage is it doesn't feel sometimes like I can ride the horse that that person has. Or, you know, they're winning that pre-St. George test and I can't ride that test because I don't have that horse. And that creates a lot of protectiveness and jealousy and resentment and feelings in the environment that aren't healthy. So there's a few things here. A we have to kind of insulate ourselves. We have to be secure in ourselves and our riding that we're not perfect. We make mistakes. We're not perfect riders. We're working to improve ourselves, but also provide some insulation to people looking and judging and viewing and saying, oh, you know, Joseph's a, uh, you know, bad rider or, you know, if I had that quality horse, it would go much better. Things like that. That's super challenging. It's super challenging to work through that and deal with that. The other thing is to be kind externally. That means like really try and push yourself because you will feel it in your body when you watch somebody ride a horse. Like you're not in their boots. You're not in their saddle riding that horse it's the person in the arena that really matters that's really out there doing it and if we're not we should try to be supportive and cheer each other on and be helpful and kind and empathetic to struggles even if we see things we would do different even if there's parts that we don't like we're still supportive in our own way and if we can twist our own body into be kind, supportive, empathetic, and then insulate ourselves a little bit from the, the community that may be attacking or resentful or, or jealous, things like that, we can find a better place to be with our horses. And I will kind of wrap this up and finish my kind of rambling thoughts on the struggle of dressage and emphasize that 
it's this puzzle. But the more we focus, I'll come back to this point, the more we focus on enjoying the daily process, finding joy in spending time with your horse and the joy in the puzzle that is how do we improve ourselves as riders so that we can support our horse and go out there in the world and find the tools, whether it's YouTube videos, whether it's your coach, whether it's a clinic, the idea generation that gets you tools to play with, play with those tools, approach it, feel your way through your horse, really get connected to them and listen, listen to the horse so they can teach you, play that way and allow yourself the space to struggle, to work on it, to come with that, uh, that attitude mentally every day just to improve a little bit. Improve your seat a little bit. Improve your horse a little bit. That's going to bring you a lot of joy. It, man, it's brutal to sport. It's, you have these huge highs, these low lows. It's tough with the horses. It's tough with um, your own riding. There will be months of struggle and then you'll improve. Keep chipping away at it. And, and just know that you're not the only one that goes through this like grind this uh, struggle in this sport, I think, I think all of us go through that. The professionals, the amateurs, everybody who really cares about riding well and communicating with the horses as well as they can, I think we're all in that together. Um, so yeah, some thoughts on dressage and riding. Thanks for being here. Obviously, I run a sales barn with uh, exclusivedressage.com. I'll put some links down there below. So if you want to check out the sales horses, you're always welcome to. And I'm happy to chat with you about forming a better, you know, horse uh, portfolio or, you know, better aligning the horsepower that's going to enable that, that journey to be better for you. But yeah, I mean, I'm here. Let's chat, leave comments. I'll try to answer as many comments as possible. And, you know, life is short and we love our horses. We love our dressage. And for me, there are more things than horses. There's, you know, my wife and my kids and my family. But the truth is that dressage is this puzzle. And... I love the puzzle. I love playing with the puzzle. I love being with the horses. I love tinkering with it and trying to figure that part out. So that's my message. Uh, kind of let me know your stories down below and uh, we'll see you in the next video. Thanks guys.